much for your patience. Sorry about that. <clears throat> it's really nice to speak here. I spoke last year um, about some of my adult questions and problems, and I'm, you know, I'm using this as a forum more to get input from this panel of experts. I think this is a unique opportunity to have people who are viewing this disease from the same lens and perspective that I am. So this is not um, finished work or, or work that I feel um, entirely confident about. Some of the speakers this morning, you know, had a body of literature that they really, you know, felt strongly about and stood behind. And this is more, I'm throwing it out to you, and at the end I'm going to give some questions that I would really like your feedback on and actually really like participation with some of the other pediatric neurosurgeons in the room in terms of giving me some uh, advice and, and maybe sharing patients so we can put something together um, for the field here. This is a slide that I used in my adult talk last year because I think it agrees. It, it, uh, it cuts across the board from both pediatric to adult Chiari, of course, and based upon the last lecture we heard and the, the need for a 41-site randomized center study to answer a simple question, clearly this is something that we can all uh, get behind. Um, you know, I, I think the reason why I'm exploring this topic and why I'm, you know, presenting it today is because those of us who see all these patients, we sit in the exam rooms and we talk to patients and we think about these complicated problems and we, we figure out ways to deal with them. But then there are patients that just don't fit into simple pods and there are patients that we struggle with. And so I think all of us who see a lot of patients certainly um, think about this and come up with different angles. And so if we don't use this as an opportunity to share these, I think we, we lose an opportunity to really learn from each other. So what I wanted to talk about today is a real small subset of patients, um, but I think a unique cohort of kids that I've recognized over the last uh, seven or eight years who have ventral tonsillar herniation. All the pediatric neurosurgeons who I've talked to all kind of nod and agree, and we presented this at PEDS section meetings, and I've gotten really good feedback about it from other people, and um, I've gotten independent you know, suggestions on what to call this from a bunch of people, but they don't really re meet current radiographic definition. That's why I thought it would be worthwhile to, to describe it. Um, the part that was interesting to me was that the ventral herniation, to me, seemed like probably explained the medullary symptoms that these kids were having. These were often infants, um, toddlers, um, much more than, than older children and adults, who I thought may have compression of brainstem nuclei or nerves, um, without that impressive caudal descent that we usually define Chiari by. So I wanted to present it to you guys, see what you guys all thought, and then at the end um, give you some ideas and um, foster some discussion about how it fits into our current framework here. So just as a review, this is what I presented last year, this sort of cerebro cerebellum medullary compression syndrome and how I think about my adult patients across the board from, again, all the different things that we've heard today, you know, issues with uh, intracranial hypertension and CSF leaks and EDS and all these things. This is sort of my own algorithm when I see these complex adults, but kids really don't fit into that. Kids are a little bit more simple, um, but they have a, a different framework with which, with which we have to, you know, view them through. So these are kind of, you know, these are semi-made up, but things that we all hear all the time. They said he doesn't have Chiari because he's only herniated three millimeters. Clearly that's, you know, something that we all struggle with and we've had whole sessions and, you know, meetings dedicated to the question of what the definition of Chiari is, and so that's something that we certainly see, and particularly in little kids, their, their anatomy, their skull base is different, and that's something I'll talk about. She's aspirating in GI, I can't explain it, but my pediatrician says it's just reflux, since she doesn't have any headaches, i.e. the Chiari is probably not doing anything. Or my neurosurgeon said we only need to remove bones since she's so young, but the sleep apnea hasn't improved at all, getting back to this question of dura, no dura. So these Chiari conundrums, they present themselves to us in our clinics every day, um, and, and how we deal with them is, is probably quite variable between our practices. I won't spend too much time on this. This five millimeter rule is, you know, again, something that's been well discussed and well examined, and the question of, you know, what, to, what stock to put in a single measurement, I think, has been fairly well put to bed here. I don't think anyone in this room rejects patients based upon the presence or absence of any single measurement. There's, you know, when Brandon spoke this morning about the 27 measurements now that we have consensus upon, and clearly that, that in itself is evidence that, that we don't just use any single measurement any longer. But clearly there are um, people who are not privy to this information, i.e. radiologists, neurologists, who do firmly believe that there is a cutoff that dictates whether or not they need to be seen by a pediatric neurosurgeon uh, for evaluation. And so 
thinking about these things, you know, whether it's the pre-MRI or the post-MRI <coughs> error, are, are valid and important for us to think about, especially when we talk to non-neurosurgical groups, whether it's at CMEs or talking to pediatricians and, and disseminating that information. So since that you know, initial, diag uh, initial classification was made, a lot has been done in the classification of Chiari. And, you know, we've got sort of this laundry list now of different types of Chiari that um, we variably use or ignore. For example, the, you know, the bottom half of this chart here, I mean, I think that no one in this room really talks about Chiari 2 in the same way that we talk about the rest of the Chiari that we see. It's a really, it's a distinct disease with distinct management. Um, and then the Chiari 3, the recently described 3 and a half, for all these things that were described, you know, 150 years ago, again, are not really part of our classification, but people still kind of clinically say, well, there are four types of Chiari, and I hear that in talks still to this day, that there are four types of Chiari, when really Chiari 1.5 and Chiari 1 and now Chiari 0 really make up the bulk of what we see in our clinical practice and, and really should be what we're focusing on when we're talking about a classification scheme and examining. These are really uh, good images taken from uh, a review by Shane Tubbs and um, uh, Chiari 3 and 3.5 and, and obviously 1.5 down there. So here's the observation just to sort of lay it out, you know, the premise for the, the paper that we presented at the PEDS section. A cohort of children with, with radiographic cervical medullary compression but without either syringomyelia, so they weren't Chiari 0, it didn't reach 5 millimeters, so they weren't Chiari 1. They didn't have descent of the medulla or classic kinking, so they weren't 1.5, and obviously they weren't Chiari 2 patients. And so these young children were evaluated with symptoms consistent with the same compression syndrome we've seen over and over again, um, and they had some common radiotomic findings that I thought were, were relevant here. So I had my current, my current chief resident who's going into pediatrics, and I'm sorry that Rich Ellenbogen left because he's going to go be a Rich's new fellow out in Seattle. He and I worked on this uh, last year and basically accumulated all the patients that we'd seen who were five years or of age or younger um, who were taken care of just by me, just as a, as a first go around. I have two pediatric partners, but we sort of limited just to this population because of uh, ease of access of, of the database and um, uh, follow-up. So we retrospectively reviewed them and looked at obviously all these important issues, preoperative symptoms, imaging, management follow-up, all of those things, we'll get to those. But the, the, the key was that they um, had a ventral tonsillar position that was ventrally herniated relative to a line bisecting the medulla. And I'll show you what that means. Just like all the measurements that we have, it's a little bit arbitrary, but it was the only way that I could think of a, a simplistic way of defining what ventral herniation meant with respect to the brainstem here. And then we looked at them compared to some more typical Chiari toddlers that we take care of. So what is ventral herniation? And I'd love some feedback on whether you think this is relevant or not. Basically what I defined it as is sort of a 50% line. If you're looking at an axial view through the, you know, the, the, the bottom of the medulla at the level of maximal compression, um, if you bisect the medulla in half. And that, that, that's an, it's a relevant point. It's convenient because it's 50%. And you can draw it on an MRI scan nicely. But it's also really important because it's consistent with where the um, small rootlets of uh, the lower cranial nerves exit the brainstem. And so if you've got lateral ventral compression of the cerebral tonsils wrapping around like we see on MRI scans, um, you're going to get compression not only of the, of the nuclei uh, on the dorsum of the brainstem, but also of those rootlets exiting at the lateral aspect of the brainstem. And so here on a side view of the brainstem, a classic Gray's picture in a, in a cartoon, this is kind of the idea for where the, the line would lie. And again, it lies right along where the exiting nerve roots for you know, 9, 10, 11 exit the brainstem. And so in my mind at least, explains some of those symptoms that we see classically in toddlers, which are sleep, uh, swallowing problems, aspiration problems, and, and sleeping problems, sleep apnea. This is what it looks like on an MRI scan. So. I think a lot of people have probably seen this, and when I pointed out to a bunch of people in these meetings, they're all like, yeah, I see that all the time, and never really quite got what it is, but it's almost like the arms reaching around uh, on the brainstem here. You can see clearly that the, that the level of the tonsils is, is extending ventral to where those dorsal roots are exiting from the brainstem here. And even if you come out laterally on an MRI scan, you can see the kind of the, the way the, the wrapping of the brainstem is occurring around the lateral aspect of the, of the medulla. 
Here's another one, a little bit less exaggerated than the one we saw before, but this is the same patient where, you know, it's three millimeters of herniation. You know, that's a Chiari-esque type of patient, but if you look at the level of ventral compression there, it's a little bit more impressive than you might expect from sort of minimal herniation on the, on the sagittal view. My nurse practitioner thinks it looks like an angel with the arms kind of wrapped around there. And, you know, we see all kinds of variations. If you start looking at this, you know, you sort of make it your, you know, part of your management of evaluating the films. I think a lot of people really stick to the sagittal and then maybe they'll go to the coronal to look at the, you know, the, the asymmetry of the tonsils. But if you go to the axials, just, you'll tend to see a lot of pathology that you might miss on those other views. And here you can see a really impressive unilateral herniation. You know, we often see a lot of asymmetry in the cerebral tonsils coming down and here. The left side is completely behind the brainstem, and the right side is wrapped all the way to the ventral dura. And I'm using this picture here. This is completely stolen from someone in this group. I took a picture at a meeting a few years ago, and I, and I thought it was really nice. I don't know who it was, so if it's yours, I apologize. But it, who is it? <laughs> thank, thank you. <laughs> but it shows the, uh, you know, this idea of downward displacement on the lower cranial nerves. I kind of, I kind of like that because I, I thought it's the same principle, just applying to lateral displacement, right? We often, you know, think very clearly about how the brainstem is being deformed in the nuclei, but the, the cranial nerves, the upper cervical nerves and the lower cranial nerves, are, are involved in a way that I don't think we can really discriminate or, dis, you know, or distinguish from the brainstem compression. So, I like this picture because it really does show how those nerves are being impacted by the, the aberrant placement of the tonsil. And as I mentioned, oh, sorry, as I mentioned before, I'm sorry, this is very sensitive to movement here. Let's see if it comes back up here. Let me just go to the right slide. This, the cord is just, I keep tripping on the cord, I saw, I'm sorry. <laughs> The, um, the sleep apneic part, the, the dysphagia, obviously that suggests lower cranial nerve dysfunction to all of us who see them, and I think that, you know, for the pediatric neurosurgeons in the room, that's kind of the class, that's the textbook teaching for infant Chiari anyway, and so the natural history of these Chiari studies does suggest that patients who have dysphagia, sleep apnea, or syrinx, which we're not talking about here, are more likely to benefit from posterior fossa decompression. So. The handling of young children, or very young children, infants and toddlers with these is a little bit less clearly delineated, and so the question is whether or not these patients should be categorized based on standard Chiari parameters or whether or not this ventral lateral herniation could provide additional useful inf information. And so these are the results from the poster and the talk that, that Peter gave at the PED section meeting. Um, it's a, a cohort of, um, here are the uh, 12 children, um, six male, six female, pretty evenly matched. They're all very young, so the, the mean is two and a half years. Um, the classic findings that you'd expect, dysphagia, sleep apnea, airway problems, um, very few of them have um, presented asymptomatically. The follow-up is not great, and this is already a year old data probably, so I think it'll be, you know, when we looked um, right before this meeting, we had an additional seven patients already that we could add on there, so hopefully with some uh, collaboration amongst the crowd here, we can get a, a nice cohort together and. and present this as a team from the CSF. Um, the, uh, the presentation in surgical management uh, is quite interesting. Uh, I didn't expect this when I looked back at my own practice. I kind of thought I was a very, you know, structured guy, but I did almost every single possibility of operation in these children um, from a standard suboccipital um, to suboccipital to C1, to a split duroplasty, to a full duroplasty, to one where I included C2, and one child where I did an OC fusion child who I will regret for the rest of my life. Um, two of them were uh, needed to be repeat decompressed, um, which is something that I'll talk about in the conclusion side, and it would be you know, fairly um, expected with an infant population due to issues with bony regrowth and um, reossification of the dura in this population. And the vast majority, 85% of them, did improve with respect to these presenting findings. So this is just sort of a, you know, a um, a slide showing a bunch of the MRI scans that uh, we've already seen some of those. Um, but very interesting here is that if you look at the, the kids who had um, sort of our control population was those who had more than five millimeters and those who had less. You know, the headache and syrinx are the ones who had more than five millimeters. So I thought that was a really nice internal control from our population because that's very different than this group, which is less than five millimeters who had ventral compression, right? So on the blue, 
in the blue on the left side are the headache syrinx guys. So those are the big herniations that are presenting with syringomyelia. And on the right are the ones that don't have syrinx. You're kind of not sure what to do, but they've got ventral compression. So those are the ones who have dysphagia and sleep apnea, and they do really well postoperatively. So that was a nice internal validation um, that that was working for us. So, um, you know, thinking about the limitations when we operate on, on little kids, you know, again, the, the handful of pediatric neurosurgeons in the room here know that it's never fun to operate on infants. I think we all take it very seriously and know the risks that are involved with operating on really little kids. That's why we often, you know, restrict ourselves from opening up the dura to issues with venous congestion. Um, so we have to think about the risk and benefit when we're operating them, particularly when we know there's a 25% chance of needing to have another surgery again down the road. And so balancing what the goals of surgery are, what their symptoms is really important. They're relatively safe operations, particularly when you're probably not going to be opening up the dura, right? You're not going to get a CSF leak or have issues. These kids heal quickly. They're usually out of the hospital in a day or two. So from that perspective, they're, they're easy once you get them off the table. Uh, but two of them, or three of them, I'm sorry, 25% needed to have additional revision surgery. Only two of those were the, the ventral lateral compression ones. So definitely a risk factor for us to think about. Obviously, this is retrospective. We just you know, thought about it last year, and so went back and looked at our own case series. It's a small sample size, and it would be nice to follow them up and really see how many of these patients are asymptomatic when they're older. Uh, and then another thing that I've, that I've thought about recently is looking at my patient population for those who I didn't operate on. And we went back and looked at my infants that I've seen in clinic who are five and younger, and I have about 50 of them. Um, and so the, the patients who I've operated on are actually a small number. So for the paper, I think it would be really nice to actually look at those patients that we followed conservatively as, as a measure of looking at um, you know, what the natural history of the disease is in the very young population. So you know, looking back at the classification scheme for you know, what we typically think of the classical that, that Chiari himself des described you know, in the 1800s and what we look at now, you know, I kind of look at this as QRI 0.5 because it doesn't quite um, reach, you know, the, with the, the tonsils not quite reaching the, the cutoff for um, QRI 1, it's a little bit less than that, so it's a cute way of thinking about that there. But it's really more about um, disease and pathology at the brainstem level and, and in the medulla itself. Um, so that was a name that was given to this by three different people when we presented. They all said, oh, you should call that QRI 0.5. This is a year ago, and I'm not into naming things, but it was, it was kind of funny that three different people came up with that term. So this, I think this is something that we could all talk about here, because I think it's a small but important group of children who have a very distinct pathology, distinct symptomatology, um, and that do very well, but may be getting missed because of lack of, of meeting our traditional criteria. So obviously I wanted to ask everyone if they've had experience with this. I, anecdotally, I know that people have commented on the wrapping of the tonsils. People call it different things, um, ventral lateral wrapping, you know, ventral compression. Um, it would be nice to talk about whether this applies to adults. I, you know, I've started looking for an adults, and there clearly are patients in whom, in whom you see this, but um, I think it's a little bit more complicated because they're often difficult to separate these things out from all the other myriad symptoms that they often present with. This is a nice population because they're relatively healthy kids who have a very focal exam that focuses on the, on the medulla. And so um, it's just a little bit easier for me to think about it in that sense, but I think adults certainly have ventrolateral herniation if you look at enough of them. I also, you know, think about this with respect to the growing pediatric skull. You know, I think that the foramen magnum expands, the posterior fossa expands, but the natural history of the space in the posterior fossa, I think the reason I don't operate on a lot of them and why I have these 50 kids that I've never operated on is because I think a lot of them grow out of it. You know, and you really only have to operate on the kids who have, you know, life-threatening issues if they've got central sleep apnea and if they, they're aspirating clearly on, on swallow studies. So I think there's something that we can learn about how the posterior fossa grows over time. Um, and then I thought about the actual surgery itself, and um, I, I personally don't do a whole lot of tonsillopexy, which is, I think, I know a whole other question that people can talk about. But I was thinking that if you're considering this as a disease of tonsils compressing on cranial nerves, wouldn't that influence your decision to do it? And I've thought a little bit more about whether or not I'd be more apt to pull the tonsils out of the gutter. And we've all seen these where you actually pull them out from around the dura and you shrink them down. And, it's very rewarding. Um, I don't typically do that except in really severe cases, but that might be something that we could discuss uh, about as well. And so if anyone's interested in discussing this further or wants to contribute some cases, uh, I'd love to collaborate with you and, and see if we can work some more in making this a, a clear definition. So thank you very much.